It is four o'clock, so we are going to get started. Hello, Vandals. I'm so glad that all of you could join us today. My name is Kathy Barnard. I am the alumni director here at the University of Idaho and a proud Vandal alum myself. And uh, I just wanna thank so many of you for joining us today. It's been wonderful. Um, I wanna give a special welcome to a few of our guests. And I think most of them are either on or coming on. Our provost and vice president, Tori Lawrence is with us today. Vice President um, for Advancement, Mary Kay McFadden is with us today. Mark Chopin, the Dean of the College of Business and Economics, and Larry Stauffer, Dean of the College of Engineering will be joining us. Randy Luton, Nick Weber, and Rick Sparks, all current members of the Alumni Association Board are going to be with us today, and I really appreciate their attendance. And we're also honored to have Dr. Dave Whitehead, the CEO of Schweitzer Engineering, with us today. So welcome, special welcome to you, Dave. I'm glad you could join us. And apparently your father too. That's awesome. Ed Whitehead <laughs> is, Ed White has, is with us this evening. Um, before we get started, just a couple of reminders. Uh, remember to keep your mute button on. And if you have questions today for Dr. Schweitzer, please send them directly to my coworker, Christy Overfeld. She's waving there. And we'll uh, field as many of those as we possibly can at the end of the program if we have some time left. And now it is really my true honor to introduce Dr. Ed Schweitzer. Ed's the founder, president, and chief technology officer of Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories. Recognized as a pioneer, a true pioneer in digital power system production, he was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame in 2019 in recognition of his invention of the microprocessor-based digital relay. He's been credited with, quote, and this is a quote, revolutionizing the performance of electric power systems with computer-based protection and control equipment and making a major impact in the electrical, in the electric power utility industry. Um, he started SEL in the basement of his Pullman home while continuing his work as a professor at WSU. And today, SEL products are installed in virtually every substation in North America, and they've been sold in 166 countries. The company has experienced continuous growth. Those of us who live here on the Palouse know that. We've witnessed that. And now they have more than 5,200 employees including nearly 200 college interns, many of them, I am proud to say, are vandals. So um, we're thrilled. We were thrilled when the opportunity arose to have Dr. Schweitzer share his expertise with the vandal family, especially in light of the recent power grid issues in uh, Texas. What a timely time to have um, Ed with us. To make the best use of our time, I'm going to turn the floor over to him now um, we'll still field questions if there's um, time at the end of the hour. So with no further ado, welcome, Dr. Schweitzer. We're so um, excited to hear uh, what you have to tell us. Well, uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you all for joining us this afternoon uh, for a cup of Joe. Of course, it's uh, 4.03 out here on the West Coast and that's a little late for most of us to, to drink coffee. But uh, it reminded me of uh, Stan Zokol, who was uh, kind of like an older brother I never had, a, a genius in the area of protection and a, a fellow uh, uh, with SEL. And uh, Stan liked to tell the joke about the guy talking to his friends. Hey, Fred, you, uh, how much coffee do you drink in a day anyway? And Fred says, I don't know, six or eight cups. And the guy says, Fred, doesn't that keep you awake? And Fred answers, well, it helps. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about uh, something real serious, you know, is uh, uh, what happened in Texas. It left so many people uh, freezing in the dark and interrupted their lives, uh, even on top of a, a pandemic uh, in, uh, in addition to the other challenges that uh, uh, we, we face every day. And in sort of a right hemispherical or a philosophical way, what this is about this afternoon is just taking a little time to think about how could so many good people, smart people, hardworking people, 
who are out there in the cold trying to get things back on and, and how uh, the designing things and working so hard. How could this happen to such well-intentioned, hardworking, good, uh, good people? And uh, probably uh, most of us are engineers in this this afternoon, and we've probably witnessed a lot of strange arguments that of, uh, of people saying, well, it's the fault of too much wind or not enough solar. And no, I don't think it is. I think uh, uh, that uh, everybody wanting to point the finger at somebody else in a big hurry is not gonna get us where we need to go. And we have to go back and, uh, with deliberation and uh, think about the, the facts of life here beginning with F equals MA and you can't push on a rope. And we go forward from there and say, how did we get here? How can we avoid something like this happening again? What lessons can we learn? Not trying to pin the tail on some donkey somewhere. So that's really the, the, the spirit that I wanna talk about is this basic good in every human being, every engineer, technician, lineman, regulator, politician, everybody, has the best interests, I believe, at heart. And that uh, somehow this whole horrible Valentine's Day thing, you know, I grew up in Chicago and the Valentine's Day massacre was one thing down there on, uh, on uh, uh, um, uh, um, oh, I forgot the street now, doesn't matter. But here's another kind of a Valentine massacre. massacre. This one, of course, took out a whole bunch of wall plugs. I want to go back to the to our legacy, which we've inherited in this industry from uh, Edison and uh, his uh, sidekick, uh, Samuel Insull. Insull, uh, contrary to many people's opinions, was not the person they named the insulator after. Uh -uh. Sam Insula, he was a, that was supposed to be a joke, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, for even trying. And Sam Insula emigrated to the United States as a pretty young man, one purpose, that was to work for Edison. And uh, he did a, a marvelous job in uh, coming up with a concept of the uh, public service company, what my dad called when I was a kid, the PS company. And in 1911, happened to be the year my mom was born, we endeavored to give the very best possible service we can at the lowest possible price. That's what he set out to do, he and Edison. Two years later, he said, I often wish I could see 50 years ahead, which would have been 1963, that's come and gone. I should expect to see a vast distribution system stretching from one end of the country to the other wherever the density of the population justified it. There will be the closest cooperation between the man who produces his power from steam and the man who produces his power from water, a cooperation that will lead to a cost of energy so low as to place it within the reach of all and make it possible to develop it in almost any place, almost any class of industry. That dream in 19... 13 was certainly a reality long before 1963, thanks to the vision and genius of Edison and Insull and so many other people. That's our legacy, which we have inherited. These guys are real smart. They figured out that the basis for utility profits is the, profits is the diversity of demands. And at a YMCA meeting in New York, 1914, stated that the fundamental basis of profits making, profit making in a public service business is a diversity of demand. That is the difference between one human being and another human being. The desire of one of us to do one thing and the desire of another being to do something else at the same time. He realized that not all of us are going to turn on all of our lights at the same time. A diversity in demand. Diversity in demand. 
Now, this is, they did measurements to prove it. They didn't have computers or even strip chart recorders. They had some pr pretty primitive tools to uh, go out and figure out all of this stuff in, at the turn of the century. But what they realized, you know, there were some people who thought that the way the electric power system would evolve would be a generating plant in the, it would go downtown in uh, Chicago in the loop, Wacker Drive, that's where that massacre was. <laughs> um, go down in the big buildings there on State Street, here's Monkey Wards and Marshall Fields and Sears and Roebuck and others. They figured right along next to the, the boilers for heat in these buildings, there'd be a, a generating plant to make electricity. And then when people went home from the shopping, uh, uh, from these department stores, they'd probably just turn the plant off for the night and start it up the next day. And these guys realized that capital always got its pay. That idle plant wasn't doing anybody any good. That was not going to work. It was not going to be an effective, efficient uh, way of uh, uh, use of uh, uh, these resources. Meanwhile, there's people in other industries who thought, well, there's a company in uh, England that was established to with one purpose, they wanted to make electric street lights, electric street lighting systems. And guess what? Their generator would only run at night. As soon as the sun came up, it could turn the plant off because everybody could see well enough without running that plant. So now you got the plants in the basement of the, you know, hypothetically uh, running department stores in the daytime, shutting off at night, and then the plants running the street lights at night shutting off in the daytime when you can use the same plants for both. The gain here is a factor of six or seven. Put another way, let's suppose that six of us each has a generator at home. Well, with these kind of numbers, then we could, the six of us could use one generator instead of each of us having our own because of the diversity. Now across a population of six, it doesn't average out that good, but between parking garages and street lighting and making of ice uh, in those days before everybody had refrigerators and so on, that there is such diversity of demand that it meant that you could supply people with their electricity with one sixth of the equipment and therefore of the capital in a very capital intensive industry. That was the diversity of demand. Now, what makes all this work is that we move electricity at the new energy at the speed of light, 186,000 miles a second. That's faster than our friends in the communications industry move information because they're moving it generally through fiber at 0.6 C. Ah, we got them beat. And guess what? It's a hell of a lot faster than moving coal at 30 miles an hour in a freight train or a line pack of oil at maybe three miles an hour in a, uh, in a pipeline. So we get to do this. This is part of our legacy. We get to the privilege of serving a vital industry, moving energy at the speed of light. The value of that we already saw comes from combining the diverse intermittent loads, which all of us present to the power system, means less capital and lower rates for everybody. But guess what? Today, when we are introducing in significant scope solar panels and wind turbines, the same thing happens with this intermittency to some degree, but not totally to this intermittency of sources. Now let's face it, solar panels have a common factor, don't they? For the electricity they produce, what is it? The sun. So you can't get electricity easily around uh, from, uh, 24 hours a day in Pullman, Washington by solar panels. You can't even do it across uh, four time zones because of the transmission losses. Uh, two time zones maybe. So even when there's common factors like this, we start to lose some of the diversity. However, the electric power system, the transmission and distribution networks add value to these intermittent sources. And these are the fundamental bases that 
we must consider in the, uh, for the profits in the public service business. Here's a little thought. Let's think about the value added here. Let's suppose we consider a ready wholesale generator like, uh, oh, I don't know, a uh, 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 hydroelectric dam and, and its generators. And uh, well, I guess at a dam right now, it's about uh, one and a half cents, but just I picked a price here from a ready dependable source of to say three cents uh, wholesale. Retail, maybe that comes out at a dime or 13 cents. And what about an intermittent wholesale kilowatt hour? What's that worth? Greater than, equal to, or less than three cents. It has to be worth less because it's not always there. It might not be there when I need it. So a utility should be entitled to buy it cheaper. So utilities add value to wind and solar in these four ways, serving faraway markets, smoothing out the diversity of these intermittent supplies, and the ready generators, coal plants, nuclear plants, uh, gas turbines, and other things, they serve steady and dynamic peak loads. Hydro not only is a ready generator, but it also is a very, very effective economically and uh, scale-wise way to store energy. Now, another aspect I want to talk about is going back to this original vision of Edison and Insull of uh, regulated monopolies. A monopoly sounds like a bad thing. It sounds, you know, reminds us all, of course, of the board game that uh, uh, most of us probably played too much of as kids, you know. But in the engineers club out in Dayton, he said there was one course of action I laid down to produce the greatest possible amount of energy at the lowest possible investment cost and operating cost and to sell that energy at the lowest possible price at the same time making the investment a fair and satisfactory return for the people who take the securities by the stocks. That's what he set out to do. And of course, he realized that if there was a mon monopolistic regional franchise for a utility, that in exchange for that, that monopoly, he must give something up, namely the privacy of his books. He would need to open his books up to some kind of regulators, those regulators then being the public utility commissioners, public utility commissions. And he wanted those to be not elected people who really weren't part of government, but they ended up, of course, being appointees of government. And over time, maybe they've become over politicized. How well did all this work? Here's this is all adjusted for uh, inflation and expressed in uh, real dollars or cents, I guess, uh, for uh, I think in the 2020 dollars. I was born in 1947, so year before I was born, it's about 43 cents a kilowatt hour. Guess what? That's about what a retail kilowatt hour costs in Germany today. That's about what a uh, retail kilowatt hour costs in some markets in California. However, look at the trend over the years. So when I was a kid, the trend was down and down and down. I graduated from college, it you know, went up a little bit. The low on this graph is, is 2002. And today we're probably about 13 and a half cents on the average. California, some other places, Hawaii, uh, it's up pretty high. Many of you are probably familiar with Little Bill. I wish I could see all of your hands because I'd ask, raise your hand if you've seen, know who Little Bill is. There's two hands. So little, two hands on one person, a lot of hands came up. Little Bill was a, uh, would sing a little jingle and it went like this, electricity costs less today, you know, than it did many long years ago. A little birdie told me so, tweet, tweet, little Bill. ComEd was celebrating that 
relentless effort they made on efficiency, which by the way, benefits the environment and reliability uh, to uh, in celebrating that in their advertisements. So this is the really the roots of our public service companies, regional monopoly, monopolies regulated by a PUC, even a natural monopoly, some people call them, recognizing that capital always gets its pay. And uh, this monopoly being a generator, transmission and distribution all planned together in a particular region, not a whole state, not a whole uh, country. And then the, these uh, individual utilities went into intertie agreements with one another and said, hey, how about your company and my company interconnect with the transmission line so that we can, we can share and benefit from some diversity between our own loads. And guess what, also for diversity of generation. That way you and I can kind of uh, postpone when we have to build the next plant and also that between us, we have enough to take our pl certain plants offline every year uh, for, for, uh, for maintenance. So that's where they came from, the intertie agreements. Transmission interties for dependability and economy. And the PUC's role to ensure for prices were fair and that profits were reasonable enough so that the holders of the debt in terms of utility uh, uh, stocks could get a reasonable rate of return on their investments. Used to be cash, bonds, utility stocks, then other stuff in terms of uh, lease risk uh, going up. And a deeply rooted spirit in public service that does extend to, uh, to today in, in, our, in our industry, which makes it uh, even a bigger uh, honor to serve it. I want to think, been thinking about this, that even these monopolies that we know compete to serve by giving the best price, the, uh, the lowest price and the most value. And Insel said so in 1911. So then what happened is, uh, well, we went through a phase of re-regulation that was driven, uh, some folks think mainly by uh, Enron, wanting to deregulate the generation part of it so they could build generating uh, plants that were not so heavily regulated uh, pretty much anywhere a gas pipeline crossed an electric uh, transmission line. So the idea was that these deregulated generators could produce power and send it into the grid where the grid is really those intertie inter uh, uh, transmission lines taken together in aggregate there was uh, never, of course, anything that was carefully designed out to be a national grid. Distribution companies would buy the energy from that grid as if you were going to a Saturday market for apples and, and uh, uh, tomatoes or something. It's uh, managed by ERCOT in Texas, but ERCOT doesn't own any G, T, or D. It was a human construct necessary to be able to control what was going on. It's the Electricity Reliability Council of Texas, a name that uh, is especially um, kind of difficult to, to listen to in the context of uh, um, uh, what happened in February. Retailers further market the energy to consumers. And what's sort of missing today, I believe, is this close link of public service companies dedicated to its customers that do the whole thing the generation, transmission, distribution, billing. So really, it gets a lot harder to see who's really responsible to you and me, the customer, for your and my generation. Who's really behind those ready kilowatts when you go to plug something in? Well, let's talk a little bit more directly about Texas. That was a 24 minute whereas. Here's the way ERCOT was uh, looking at things uh, last fall. The major sources, of course, of generation gas, coal, wind, and nuclear. Solar is a very small part of the picture. They forecast an extreme peak during the winter of 67 gigawatts. Their forecast reserve resources were 69 
gigawatts, leaving only a 3% margin. I think that's an awfully small margin. I don't know what you guys think, but uh, it's pretty small margin given we're dealing with uh, uh, intermittent sources of power and uh, uh, other, uh, uh, other factors. The reality is the actual peak was 69. The actual resources were only 43, leaving a margin of minus 38%. And no wonder the lights went out. One of the strangest things that I'm still trying to get my head around, and I'll bet half of you could explain it to me 10 times better than I'll try here, is why the prices, why did the PUC and ERCOT decide that they could, should, in order to somehow make more power available, kick the price up to $9 a kilowatt hour. That's what the dark red stuff is. $9 a kilowatt hour. Don't forget, average retail price <clears throat> is uh, 13 cents. $9 a kilowatt hour. And what's, this is a picture from uh, February 16th. You'll notice in the lower, you know, along the Rio Grande here, next to Mexico, the little region where it's dark blue. Dark blue is associated with negative prices. So here in most of Me <laughs> Texas, used to be Mexico, as my wife will tell me, because she, she's from Mexico, that uh, in most of Texas, that the, the wholesale prices were bumped up to $9 a kilowatt hour. And in certain areas, uh, it was negative, priced negatively. And you kind of wonder, I mean, I've watched this map, I've had it running on another monitor for about a month. And I keep watching it, and it changes like a colors of a kaleidoscope as these prices is going on. I don't understand that. Here's what Texas looked like this morning. They're, you know, pretty good. And then look at the bottom, uh, all the way down there in the bottom. It didn't look too good. There's some areas where the prices were sky high again, right next to some other areas within miles where this stuff was was even negative. I'll take I'll pay you to take it. Here's what the Wall Street Journal presented on uh, the uh, February 17th. They showed that uh, wind had dropped off in, in a period of about four weeks by uh, uh, 20 gigawatts. And uh, coal picked up some of that by going up to two or three uh, gigawatts. Natural gas picked up most of it. And then one nuclear unit of the South Te Texas process uh, uh, project shut down. Oops. Did I do something wrong here? There you go. Thank you. And if you lay this all out over time, the very bottom line here is solar. There's just not a whole lot of solar. In, in Texas yet. I actually think that more solar probably would have helped this picture out a lot. And then the, the gray line is uh, nuclear. Well, that was pretty good until one of the four units out there at the end dropped off. The brown line here, brown because it's coal, I guess, it did pretty good. And when, when things started going bad with the wind, you can see how it went up a little bit, and then it got into some trouble. And natural gas is really what people were, were depending on until it got into some trouble in the super cold weather. Speaking of the ERCOT service area, I put four red dots on this map to show you the four interconnections of ERCOT to the rest of the world. Those are asynchronous ties, or essentially back-to-back -back DC converters that allow CFE in Mexico and then the Eastern Connection and the Western Connection of the United States to transfer energy as pretty much any, as uh, the dispatchers want it to flow. But all that adds up to only about 1.2 gigawatts. 1.2 gigawatts out of, what do we say, a 69 gigawatt peak. There's not a lot to bring in. But guess what? Natural gas, which was flowing to Mexico, had to be curtailed. 
the problems in the loss of natural gas propagated as far south as, uh, well, Monterey, Mexico, Zacatecas, Mexico, all the way down to threats of electric power curtailments because of the lack of natural gas as far south as um, San Luis Potosí, Mexico. Up in the north, near Wichita Falls, that's a connection to the Western inner tie in the United States, the one uh, between Tyler and Paris up there is to the Eastern. And guess what? To the East of Texas is Louisiana. It was having its own problems. Uh, New Mexico wasn't doing too well. And North of that, getting into Kansas. So a lot of this argument about, well, if we only had more transmission and if Texas were just interconnected with the rest of the country, it may not have gotten into trouble. I don't really think that's, that's it might have helped a little bit, but I don't think it would have helped a lot. Go back to insole again. Service is our duty to the public. Let us suppose by some calamity, our service is instantaneously stopped. It would stop the urban transportation lines of the city. It would stop the vertical railways of the cities, that is the elevator services. It would absolutely stop the business of our big emporiums of retail commerce. So he preached that for electricity to be successful, that it had to be absolutely reliable. So reliable that you and I would feel safe about getting into an elevator or a streetcar. Now, this is a picture from a pharmacy owned by a friend of, uh, uh, of our uh, VP for sales and customer service, which was totally ruined by pipes freezing. It's just appalling to see the kind of damage and suffering that people went through. So sometimes I wish we could just call Ready Kilowatt back to the job and uh, Ready, your tireless household service. I wash and dry your clothes, play your radios, I can heat your coffee pot. I am always there with lots of power to spare, cause I'm ready to work. Remember, just plug in. I'm ready. This was a source of great pride, a tremendous accomplishment of our industry. It's the same people today, or their kids, or their grandkids. But the, this is all of our legacy is ready kilowatt. And I really believe because of the way that we have reorganized that we have gotten ourselves into a few problems. So how are we gonna solve this? Because one question is to ask sort of where's ready kilowatt? Should we return to the regional franchises for generation transmission and distribution? Well, I think uh, many people would tell me and you that uh, if you wanted to do that, uh, uh, good luck, but you ain't ever going to get that toothpaste back in the tube. And should we insist on PUCs that balance the interests of customers and shareholders? Perhaps. I think that's a, a, a good one. Or empower customers. We already pay for what you use. But what if your distributor were to pay you when they can't supply you? After all, how's that pharmacist going to pay for all of the damage caused because he didn't have electricity. If that were to happen, that distributor has got to get the money from somewhere. And if the source of the problem is the generators, then he needs to be able to hold the generators accountable. This all seems so complicated compared to the way that Edison and Insel uh, envisioned and, and uh, built such a tremendous system in our country. What are other ideas? Well, gosh, we could buy more backup generators for our homes, offices, factories, and schools. Every, I think virtually every building at SEL has got a backup generator in it. Sewage treatment plants have it, sewage pumping stations, uh, water, uh, water facilities in many places have uh, backup generators, hospitals, um, uh, maybe communities need to be, have more backup generators. Maybe distribution companies need to invest in generation again themselves. Uh, but we must store fuel on site. You know, if we try to run everything from the gas pipelines, well, the pressures drop back. There's a new codependence between heating and electricity, both requiring natural gas, 
any further codependence there as the electricity is now the source of energy used to drive the compressors into pipelines. So now you've got an, an evil thing going on. You lose electric power, you can't push the gas through the pipeline. Used to be that those uh, compressor stations were essentially jet engines that uh, would run from the, uh, the few, very, a little bit of the very fuel they were trying to move. Solar and wind are in, intermittent. I don't see them solving the problem entirely on their own. Hydro is renewable. Water behind the dam is economical and a dependable storage. We do need to build more transmission, I think, but nobody likes looking at it. And those are the, this transmission is the key to making these intermittents less intermittent. Uh, small nukes, well, now we're talking way out in time and we got an emergency on our hands, I think. So what might actually happen? Well, maybe the fourth time here is the charm. Everybody talked about the 2021 Valentine's Day surprise as a storm of the century. But there's been major winter storms with similar kinds of effects of different proportions, 2011, 2003, 1989. And in these, there have been the recommendations to do more winterization of plant. And I think maybe that we will see that happening both through regulations and also because of the strong legacy of our industry to be to produce dependable power. Maybe the PUC ERCOT pricing model will be rejected and when they try to use it as a supply driver, expecting you know, generators to, to pop up if they only increase the price. We've already seen some resignations from ERCOT and the uh, Texas Railroad Commission, the latter entity being what's responsible for the gas distribution. Uh, we know that six days from now, the House Energy and Commerce Committee uh, will meet and they're gonna be discussing this. Um, gosh, I guess this is an opportunity for us as we, the people to be sharing with our, electric, uh, our elected officials, what we know about electricity. It, it, it's, it, the Energy and Commerce Committee, they cover not only electric power and, and uh, but uh, all kinds of energy. They also cover healthcare. And uh, I think it's the largest, committee and the third oldest committee in the house. So how can we expect the politicians to be experts on this? And I do think it's an opportunity for us to, to uh, lend them you know, a hand. Uh, there's already hearings and investigations underway in Texas. We have one employee, I think she's what watched about what 40 hours, what is it, 45? 50 hours of, uh, huh? You have testimony on the equivalents of uh, uh, what do they call it, TBW or these sorts of networks. And uh, we'll, I, it's kind of a want is, is an ask is maybe capital will start to flow to dependable generation and transmission. Wouldn't we help our politicians? It kind of reminds me of the need to uh, think back to the age of enlightenment. You know, Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations wrote that uh, it always it must be in the interest of the great body of people to buy whatever they want of those who sell it cheapest. And this uh, proposition could never have been called into question had it not been for the interest, the interested sophistry of merchants and manufacturers confounding the common sense of mankind. And I think he didn't know it, of course, but he might have been talking about some of the people. Uh, involved with Enron many years ago. Milton Friedman referred to that by talking about it, saying if an exchange between two parties is voluntary, it will not take place until they both believe they will benefit from it. So if Dave wants to sell me his car and I want to buy it, we come up with a, with a deal. Dave's going to be happy he's got some money and I'm going to be happy that I don't have to ride my bicycle. And then we all sort of benefit from that because of uh, the way the economy works. And he go, went on to say most economic fallacies divide, uh, derive from the neglect of this simple insight, namely 
from the tendency to assume that there is a fixed pie and that one party can only gain at the expense of another. That's not true. With this uh, invisible hand of uh, the, uh, economic and political freedom, we will solve these problems. In conclusion, electric power moves at the speed of light. What a beautiful thing that is. That to me is just the marvel of our industry. And it goes back to what uh, Insel was saying with his vision that uh, now we can generate it wherever we can generate it and we can send it and serve people over vast areas and distances. But available generation must exceed the load, otherwise the lights go out. Economic arrangements need to be simple and easy to understand. Regulations need to be simple too. And our regulators should not have this ability to suddenly say, no, the Texas price uh, should uh, vary all over the place and be kicked up, kicked up the nine bucks a, a kilowatt hour, adding insult to industry or to uh, injury, I'm trying to say. And finally, the responsibility for dependable generation must be closer to us customers. Sometimes I wish that Ready Kilowatt, this is uh, the, the Texan personification of the personification of electric uh, uh, um, dependability. And sometimes I wish he would get on his white horse and ride into town and uh, be there whenever you plug in with lots of power to spare. Einstein said there's really only ways, two ways to live your life. One is if nothing is a miracle and the other is as if everything is. And I think that electric power is a miracle. It's the ability that humankind has mastered to send power over vast dis distances, you know, 11 inches in a night microsecond or six microseconds to cover a mile. It is truly a miracle. And we feel blessed, graced, fortunate to have, to be in a role to uh, serve this important legacy. Thank you very much. Oh my gosh, thank you so, so much, Dr. Schweitzer. Um, we do have time for questions, which is awesome. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to my coworker, Christy Overfeld. Christy, what have we got uh, for questions so far? We have a few questions and a lot of comments. Um, but the first question is, in terms of protecting our power from a targeted attack, how is SEL innovating the security systems of the electric power systems in use on a daily basis? So that sounds like a cybersecurity question. So what, what I, 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 I take it as that. Okay. So uh, my first job out of school is working for. Uh, a particular agency of the Department of Defense. And I had a real good upfront look at what uh, uh, people were trying to do, uh, reading each other's mail and uh, uh, otherwise uh, uh, interfering with these with uh, communications. And it made me aware that when I started uh, thinking about making digital protective relays that we must protect uh, our customers and everybody who plugs something in from the risk of somebody being able to call into a digital relay and turn the power off or change the settings on a relay. So from, from day one in 1984, we had uh, provided uh, different levels of passwords and, and, and uh, alarm contacts and a whole array of uh, capabilities to uh, um, control the problem. And that was in the device. And then in systems, we worked with utilities to do clever things like interposing relays driven by a SCADA contact that would open up the telephone line between the modem and the, and the uh, protective relay systems. And then we have built on those over the years. And uh, Dave Whitehead and I love to tell people uh, when it comes to critical in infrastructure, never connect critical infrastructure to the internet. The internet is Star Wars bar scene. It is not a safe place. So why would anybody ever plug 
critical infrastructure into the internet. Don't do that. So we got two things going on. One is sort of a, uh, a serious need of not to do that on the one hand, and on the other hand, an awareness that lots of people really want to do that, and we have to uh, provide means of uh, uh, protection for that. We have developed uh, uh, crypto products, uh, software-defined network switches where nobody talks to anything until you put the paths into place. Uh, many, many different kinds of technologies as well as practices that uh, uh, including supply, supply chain control. And uh, uh, we write our own code here in the United States. We manufacture our own products at our own plants. We're not sending our designs out to somewhere else where they may come back with a surprise in them. And these are some of the things that come to mind in answering. Security group that does nothing but. What's that? Nick's security group. Oh, yeah. So we have uh, a group that does nothing but cybersecurity uh, activities um, in relationship to uh, the uh, U.S. Department of Energy uh, and other, other parts of government. So this is something that is in our genetics from day one. All right. Next question is, what do you see as the future of energy production and transmission 60 years from today? 60 years from today, the production and transmission? Yes. Production will be nuclear. I'll go that far. Then we will see. I probably won't live long enough to see it. I'm 73 and 60 years now. I won't be here six years now. But, uh, I think a lot of people are real happy about that. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I think that uh, nuclear is the cleanest, the safest way that, uh, that humankind has uh, come up with to uh, produce uh, uh, energy. And one measure of the safety of it is a calculation of, it's a little macabre, I guess, but it's the kilowatt hours produced divided by the number of lives lost doing it. The lowest number, the fewest lives have been lost by generating power uh, from, by splitting the atom. So that's for the generation. For the transmission, I think, uh, uh, we will see a heck of a lot more DC transmission, distribution, and use and continued use of AC transmission. I think we will see on the AC side, we will see circuit breakers that operate, and this is not in 60 years, some of these things I will live to see them, Lord willing, is that uh, we will see AC circuit breakers that aren't taking three cycles or two cycles or one cycle, but maybe five milliseconds, two milliseconds to interrupt faults. Why? Because we can already do that on DC. If you think about the way an AC circuit breaker works, it waits for a current zero. Well, shoot, if you tried that on DC, you'd wait forever because there ain't no current zeros in DC. So you gotta force the current zero. We know how to do that in DC. We sped up the protection from cycles down to milliseconds. And we know that our friends who are making circuit breakers are speeding up, uh, are prepared to speed up AC uh, 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 circuit interruption because they already do a wonderful job of it at DC. Great. Okay, what is the parallel between ERCOT and Enron? I don't believe there is one. I do believe that uh, the FERC 888, FERC 889, the two major pieces of legislative uh, uh, rulemaking that came out of uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission in 1992, that uh, that was 
uh, is strongly influenced by uh, Enron. And, uh, and this is a, it was with, I think, the, what the Clinton administration and the Bush administration, both political parties give an equal time here to their involvement uh, in this. I'm not saying we ought to throw all that out, but I do think a lot of the, the energy that was put into that was uh, well-intentioned, but maybe not all of it, that there was this, this uh, uh, a compelling desire to be able to put merchant plants where a transmission line and a pipeline cross. So how does that then relate to the way um, ERCOT was formed? I don't think it has much at all to do with, uh, it's a very indirect uh, influence through, uh, um, to the point of being nil. Mm -hmm. Okay, a couple more, there's quite a few more now, they're coming in, coming in fast now. Thank you for the presentation. How reliable is the use of hydrogen fuel power generators? dry cell batteries as a backup for extreme conditions such as witnessed in Texas. Everything works pretty good till you run out of it. <laughs> so where do you get the hydrogen? You know, uh, during one of the Bush administrations, I forget which one now, there was a big push to hydrogen. Anybody remember that? And we, yes. the country spent a few billion dollars on, I can't remember the, the level now. And people predicted a hydrogen economy. You know, there's a, there's something to be said for it. If I could take electricity from excess wind, excess sun, and decompose water into oxygen and hydrogen, hey, I'm storing the fuel right there that I can then turn around and use in a fuel cell or uh, uh, even burning it. If the stuff burns clean. All you do is take that oxygen back and put it together. The hydrogen get the energy you put out. That's all in all, a pretty uh, uh, straightforward process. So that's a, I think there's some, some place for hydrogen uh, in the energy mix. I'm kind of an all of the above guy. So was there another part of the, oh, dry cells? The idea of using dry cells? Yes, it says hydrogen fuel power generators slash dry cell batteries, yeah. Well, the fuel cell technologies, you know, the first ones were used in a space program, I think in the Gemini program, and boy, have they improved uh, since. There continues to be a lot of work in that area that, uh, uh, but I don't foresee an immediate major role of uh, fuel cells as uh, 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 for the uh, bulk generation. Okay. What do you predict is the most realistic near-term future of battery technology for storing excess solar or wind energy and serving as backup in cases of grid failure? Is Tesla onto something? Tesla has done a remarkable thing and other people driving the costs of uh, battery storage down that a few years ago, maybe we would have been talking about $1,000 of a battery to store a kilowatt. And now I guess we're down, what, maybe $100, $125 to store a kilowatt of uh, electricity. That's a big change. So uh, it's still a very expensive thing to do. I guess that we were looking at it the other day in here in the whiteboard over here, that uh, you think about a um, battery in an electric car that uh, to say a $5,000 item that stores $40 of electricity, $30 of electricity, and compared to a gas tank that probably costs $40, the OEM price of a gas tank for a, you know, that holds uh, say 30 gallons of gas, that uh, was a, a lot more energy storage. So you compare these two things that store, uh, the gas tank stores more energy than, the, than this battery I was thinking about, $40 uh, 
and maybe $5,000. So the economics of this are, uh, are really in play these days. If you think about the battery charge, discharge, uh, wear out, so you take a, a $5,000 battery and say it's good for uh, 1,000 cycles, just to do uh, boardroom math here, that'd be five bucks a cycle and it's 70 kilowatt hours. And that's, a, I don't know, what does that come out here? Uh, about seven cents a kilowatt hour. Did I do by right? Joe, he's the finance guy and he's good with numbers. And uh, he'll tell me the nine decimal points and places in a minute. But that's the cost. The cost of wear and tear on the battery is something on the order of the cost of the energy that is uh, stored and replaced. And um, that can be very useful. It can be tremendously useful. We do it every day with our phones. Like a few years ago, I had somebody calculate, Greg Zweigel, calculate how much equivalent gasoline is the energy stored that you, you, know, you put in to fill up the battery of your cell phone. And I think it was like three drops from an eyedropper. That's kind of a fun number to think about. So uh, as far as uh, bulk storage, that more and more people are doing it. And if you get the price of electricity up high enough, if the electricity prices skyrocket, then the batteries start to make, make some kind of economic sense. But when you go back to the uh, vision that Edison and Insul and probably all of us really want, which is to uh, have uh, economical power as well as uh, safe and reliable and clean, that uh, um, uh, increasing the cost of electricity is not a way to make the battery uh, affordable. And then I go back to the first part again, where we started, is that uh, today that batteries are worth considering in some special cases, as the price of, and more and more as the cost of the batteries uh, goes down. Yeah. There will be, you, you look at uh, um, GM, they have a large battery plant in um, Tennessee, and I guess they want to build another one in Northeast Ohio, I forgot where. And it's going to be a, a huge projects. Uh, they've bet the farm on, uh, on uh, electric vehicles by what, 2035, is that what it is? And uh, then you turn that problem right around and say, where are they going to plug those things in? The biggest single load you'll have at home is when you get home this afternoon and plug your electric car in, that's going to be a lot more than turning on your clothes dryer and refrigerator and so forth. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, our time together is coming to a close. So um, Dr. Schweitzer, I just can't thank you enough for taking the time to walk us through that uh, really thought-provoking stuff. And like I said, so timely with what had uh, what we've all witnessed in uh, happening in Texas. Um, I want to give a little plug here. If you're interested in this topic or want to hear more about topics like this, you need to check out um, Schweitzer Drive. It's a bi-monthly podcast that um, explores what goes on between the generation of electricity and the light switch. And um, Dr. Whitehead uh, hosts that uh, program and he talks with entrepreneurs, innovators, and, and uh, experts who are inventing the future of electric power. You can find it on iTunes, Google Podcast, and Spotify. So once again, thank you so, so much, Dr. Schweitzer. Thank you, Dave. Um, thank you all for um, joining us for this special edition of uh, Cup of Joe. And as always, go Vandals. Have a great evening. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.